suspected that the, the power actually resided, and Nimrod knew this. So, rather than letting Abraham and Sarah stay with their true godly power in his own country, and thus eclipse his power of his kingship, he honors them and then kicks them out. That's the basic theme. Now, what I'd like to do, this takes me through uh, page 62, and, and actually page 63, he discusses the ties between the Egyptian and Hebrew wisdom literature. They're very old, and, and they're quite full, and these stories have familiar overtones of Abraham and Joseph, the most striking being the special altar erected for a rival threatening the throne who is delivered from the flames, and then he goes to prison, as Abraham is imprisoned by the king, and nonetheless he holds him in high esteem. So it's it's very remarkable how the the themes of this tie in. Well, one of the keys to the understanding of the uh, the the parallel with Egypt and with Abraham and with the ancient Hebrews, the philological key to the problem, according to Rosny, the great philologist. He says we must now seek the Hamit, the Hamito Semitic home in the region of the original Indo European home. All of the great languages of the earth, ancient and modern, spring from a single center. This center, Horazne says, is north of the Black Sea, the Caucasus, and Caspian Sea. It seems altogether likely that the earth was populated from Central Asia. Now I'm finding this in Nibley's book An Approach to the Book of Mormon. This is the third edition in the Collected Works of Hugh Nibley, 1988. This is way back on page 330. The principal philological key to the problem is the name Kish. This is a very powerful Old World name, as well as a Jaredite name. And it, it has variations, uh, Kish, Kash, Kush. According to Rosmi, the most widespread proper name in the ancient world was Kish, and yet it can be traced back to a definite point of diffusion in the Caspian area. This is the area Nibley always identified as Jaredite country. The Caspian Sea, in fact, Nibley thinks, was the sea in the wilderness that the Jaredites had to cross, mentioned in Ether chapter 2, verse 7. Whatever the specific aspects of this thing, the point to note is that the idea of the diffusion of all the great languages of the world and of the civilization itself from a single area in Asia and at a single time is now being seriously considered by the greatest scholars. The reason this is important is because in many of my uh, scholarly articles that I have on Nimrod, they also discuss this aspect. This this particular study by Yigal Levin, Nimrod, the mighty king of Kish, king of Sumer and Akkad. This is in the Vetus Testamentum for July 2002. I'm trying to... Uh, Trying to find the area that I had marked. Okay, here we go. The very interesting thing about the historic prototype for Nimrod is he based on a god or a demigod which the biblical version humanized. This is the question that's perplexing scholars. And several divine figures have been offered as prototypes for the Nimrod legend. Those of Nergal, the Babylonian Marduk, and the Sumerian Ninurta, all of whom are renowned as great hunters. He says that on page 356. Others have equated Nimrod with the legendary Mesopotamian heroes, such as Gilgamesh. Gunkel called him the giant Nimrod, presumably following the Septuagint, that is the Greek Old Testament. Spicer, however, seems to have been correct in rejecting an identification of Nimrod as a god or a demigod, despite the epic aspects of Nimrod's story. There isn't any textual evidence of Nimrod being anything other than mortal. So, you, you can see how the, the scholars are analyzing and trying to come to uh, some sort of an understanding. Now, Levin notes on page 358, he says the... Uh, Spicer, A.E. Spicer, he was correct in insisting on a Mesopotamian origin for Nimrod. Now, I don't have the new book out on Abraham, but there is a new book out on Abraham, I'll, I'll be getting it shortly, discussing that Abraham also came from the Mesopotamian region. It's a brand new book out last year. can't remember the name of the author. I'll, I'll get it for you, trust me. 
It's one I'm not going to let go of. Well, I'm on page 361 now in Levin's study on Nimrod, the mighty king of Kish. Notice the name, Kish. He's a, he's a Kassite. Kish is associated with the Kassites. And Levin says the decisive factor as the identification of biblical Cush, which begot Nimrod with Kish, where Sargon took power, Spicer identifies Nimrod's Cush with the Mesopotamian Kassites. So now, you see, even though we have these legends, and we have this accumulation of various different emphasis in the different legends, whether it Nimrod was a Mesopotamian, whether he was an Egyptian pharaoh, etc., Though we, as a modern outlook, would say, well, that's contradictory, and therefore all of it's false. No, this isn't the way the scholarship deals with these ancient materials. They're trying to come to some sort of an understanding using philology and history and legend and myth. Now, this is crucial. And it, we find that the Mesopotamian Kassites is a very good connection, and the connection with the city is also quite powerful. The title, King of Kish. This is the Sumerian Lugal Kisara. And the Akkadian Sharu Kishatmalti. Or the Sar Kishati. These are the Sumerian kings of the pre-Sargonic period. And the fact that the title was taken over by Sargon, and he added it to his own title, King of Akkad. But you can see how this has various interesting connections with the ancient Jaredites, as well as with the uh, legends of Abraham. It's, it's quite a remarkable thing. On page 362 of Levin's study, it was to the city of Kish that kingship itself was lowered from heaven after the flood. Like the biblical Nimrod, the ancient kings of Kish were the very embodiment of human kingship in the post-Diluvian era. So we have some very, very interesting information on the idea of kingship. Now, this is what the legends talk about. This is what our book of Abraham is discussing, the rivalry between the king and Abraham. Who has the true priesthood, you see? It's a very interesting thing that historically now, we're finding not only the philology of the names accurate and connecting with our book of uh, Ether in the Book of Mormon, of all things, which is supposed to be the oldest part of the epic of the Book of Mormon, but now we find it tying in with our own Book of Abraham and the situation that poor Abraham finds himself in. It's quite a remarkable thing. Eleven, uh, Levin concludes his study with very interesting observation. He says, The compiler of the Table of Nations, the Sumerian king lists and the Table of Nations in the uh, Book of Genesis account, they also include Nimrod, and he's one of the typological 70 descendants of Noah, of course. Well, later Jewish tradition perceived Nimrod as the archetypal evil king. His name was understood to mean, we shall rebel against God. He was the builder of the Tower of Babel, and he was the enemy of Abraham. Now, turning to back to Nibley's study on page 64, he notes that the furnace of Egypt is equivalent. C.W. Forrester, he said, the, the interesting thing about 